Hello, I'm Katisha Connor, and like you, I am wild about Washington. If you want almost guaranteed catches when you go fishing, you might try fishing for shad on the Columbia River. Will Morrison has everything that you need to know, and I mean everything. When fishing for shad on the Columbia River, some of the common baits or tackle that is used is called a dick knight, and it comes in assorted colors. It's, it's a pretty small lure, but actually it works very well. Uh, fished about 36 inch liter and about a two foot dropper with approximately four ounces of weight. Uh, comes in again so assorted colors. One of the most effective colors has always been the gold and red or gold and pink. These little lures are just trolled near the bottom or fished off the back of a boat, whichever is handy for you. And there are no limits on shad for the Columbia River, and it's a very, very popular fishery. A great way to get kids involved is have them fish this little dart for Columbia River shad. It's a great way to enjoy the day. Lots of fish, lots of action. They love having a good time out and enjoy themselves on the Columbia River. Basically, just, just your standard trout pole will work. Uh, spinning reel and rod, and maybe eight to 10 pound test line. Using, again, a little shad dart. Um, there's assorted colors. There are people who actually fish for them with just a bare hook and do very well, or a lead-headed jig. Your standard freshwater license is, is good for shad. Uh, the license issues today are 0 to 14 is free, no license required. 15 and one year only is $5 per year. And then 16 would be the adult rate, which for a freshwater license would be $21.90 a year. One of the most popular areas for fishing for shad is the area near Beacon Rock. Between Beacon Rock State Park and Bonneville Dam itself is the greatest area that uh, is used for the shad fishing. There's lots of fishing from the shore. It, you don't really need a boat. You can catch as many as you'd like. There is no limit on shad. And bank fishing is just as effective as boat fishing. When you're fishing the Columbia River, we always recommend that you wear a life vest. Uh, a life vest is something that uh, we recommend highly. Uh, safety on the Columbia River is of the utmost importance. The river is very, very deep, very, very strong, and at this time of year, running pretty hard. Uh, allow yourself lots of space between yourself and other boats. Anchor up and leave lots of anchor line out. For additional information on shad fishing and shad themselves, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife actually has a pamphlet that gives you all of the particulars on shad, uh, recipes, how to fillet it, how to fish for it, and you should be able to find it at each and every one of our regional offices or online. In early July, there's also good sturgeon fishing and also good salmon fishing on the Main Stem Columbia. So we recommend that everyone come out, enjoy yourself. When you next visit your favorite spot to catch Dungeness crab, you may see new signs posted by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. The signs encourage conservation of this valuable resource from Puget Sound. The signs are going to be posted around Puget Sound at popular public access sites where people access the Dungeness crab fishery. The signs are intended as a reminder to the crab fishers of what the rules are for fishing for Dungeness crab. The rules that are stated on the sign are not new, they're simply a reminder of the rules that have been in place for several years now. Also included on the signs are a map of Puget Sound that shows the marine area, the numbered marine areas 
that fishers are required to know when fishing for Dungeness crabs. So if you're, they're not familiar with or not sure which marine area they're actually fishing in, it's on the map and they can refer to these signs to, to get that marine area. Those marine areas are the marine areas that will be recorded on the Dungeness Crab Catch Record cards that are also required for fishing for Dungeness Crab and it's stated on the signs. Project Mule Deer is a citizen science research project. Young students get hands-on participation in wildlife field work. Under the supervision of researcher Woody Myers, these students take their work very seriously. I'm here with uh, Woody Myers doing the Project Mule Deer and I'm having fun doing this because this is what I want to do when I get, get older and grow up. Why are you putting that flagging on though? Because so that the aerial gunners um, already know that we've captured this one so they don't bring in one that we've already captured. And then I also take hair samples and help Woody out with the um, ultrasound and putting the jelly on. I'd probably have to say that my favorite thing is to put on the collars at least from what I've done so far. Um, I've done fecal samples also but that's not my big thing. We're trying to learn what the success rate in the living style and what they eat and how, what the health rate and if they're pregnant or not and what the success rate of the fawns living after they're born or how many they have or if they are just having one, two or three. Um, most of them here have had two. We had one that had three. So, so far every doe that we've brought in has been pregnant. I get Woody hooked up with like the ultrasound, getting the goo on it. I take the temperature, give shots sometimes. I like to give shots the best. That's probably my favorite thing to do. I want to become either a wildlife biologist or a game warden when I get older. So this is just helping me get ready for that. Oh, sorry. Well, yesterday we made a record of 25 deer in a day, so that was our most to make a record for one day in one spot. Sometimes your feet start to hurt, but really, you really don't get tired of it because deer are moving in and out and you get to meet new ones, name them. We've seen a lot of pregnant does. The yearlings aren't, they're normally not pregnant, but some of them are. The, the deer that have been out here since the beginning, normally they have two, sometimes they have one or three on occasion, which is very seldom. I like um, releasing the deer. I think that's fun. It seems a little scary, but I think I like it because, you know, it's always fun to see the deer run off and after I've checked them out. The mule deer population is going down and dropping, and so they're trying to learn, like, why, what's causing that and why is it happening. I'd like to be out in the field and basically do what Woody does. He's a wildlife biologist, and He's taken out the time, he's a really good guy, great guy actually, and he's taken out the time to actually be, have patience with us and That's nice. teach us everything instead of just letting us just observe. Bears roaming in populated areas have been featured in many recent news reports. Here's some good advice if you live in or visit bear country. Uh, this time of year as the bears have emerged from their dens, uh, they've gone about four or five months without food. They're very hungry. 
food resources that they are able to have access to many times or the grasses and that kind of thing. But then they find people's garbage and people leave their bird feeders up. And bird feeders, you need to understand, that's about 12,000 calories to a bear. And that's an incredible food source for them and they're gonna take those every time. And this time of the year, we don't need bird feeders. The birds will do just fine. Put your garbage out the day of instead of the night before. And those are just, those little things make such a huge difference in making sure we can live cooperatively with bears. And the same really goes for uh, camping. When you go out and you get done at night having your food, make sure that you secure your food. Put it in the ice chest in the cooler, seal it, put away in the back of the vehicle so it reduces that scent so bears don't come in. If you happen to go fishing, don't take your fish and bring them back to camp, the, back to camp with you and then gut the fish and maybe kind of throw the entrails over here. Make sure you do that away from your campsite. And when you get done cooking the fish, anything that's left, make sure you secure it in a location where it's as airtight as possible so it doesn't bring them in. Even your clothes will have a scent on them if you go fishing. And make sure that you uh, take those clothes and set them away from your campsite. And we need to understand why are they coming in? Because their whole life revolves around this thing right here, their nose. That leads them everywhere. And if there is an odor that they feel or they sense is food, they're going to come to it. And that's why just little changes in our behavior as humans in terms of reducing that potential makes uh, a lot better environment for the bears and we can also ensure that you know we don't have to go in and relocate them and we don't have to go in and maybe have to kill that bear so just those actions that you do as a person can actually save the life of a bear the agency recently honored a good friend of fish and wildlife it was appropriate to rename a game farm in centralia after retiring senator bob oak the last time I was uh, honoring Bob, um, we did a little session in the, in the Senate chambers and that was really moving and I think it was a well-deserved tribute. But I also had the pleasure of, of uh, honoring Bob for his efforts on aquatic nuisance species. And uh, with along with Senator um, Jacobson, they've been instrumental in doing a, a lot for the state of Washington relative to nuisance species. But I want to assure the senator that we don't view pheasants as a nuisance species. We don't view blackmouth as a nuisance species, and we don't view sportsmen as a nuisance species either. All of those are very important to us, and, and, and we're going to make sure that all of those continue into the future. Bob has been a, a true friend of the department. He's been a mentor to us, and he's, he's guided us in, in certain ventures as we move forward. And this is a true testimony not only to your efforts related to pheasants, but all the other issues you've helped the department through all the years. And they've been many, they've been varied, and they've been very much appreciated. And we just want to say thank you in a very small way. And this is uh, an example of uh, why we want to continue your legacy into the future by naming the game farm after you. It's a fitting tribute, and uh, we thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts. Oh, it's absolutely not going to come down. Oh. Hey. You have been watching Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can keep Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Please join us again. <laughs>